Hey there, Hillary here for Waterlogged. On behalf of Saltwater Aquarium, as you can see, I am at the ORA Aquaculture Facilities where we're gonna go meet Donna and Jordan and they're gonna show us around the facility and we're gonna learn about the operations here. So let's go check it out. environmentally friendly, not be wasteful. Uh, so these are actually not a standard plastic. Um, they're pretty indestructible. <laughs> We've had emails where people have called them diamonds of frag plugs because <laughs> they are indestructible. Uh, but each of these actually fits snugly inside of our egg crate. Oh, okay. Uh, and what that does is it keeps everything in place because our surge devices here would just create so much flow that a standard plug inside egg crate would just topple everything over. Now, I've got to ask, so I know a bunch of aquarists that use egg crate in their tanks. Is this the standard? Is there different sizes of egg crate or is this pretty standard what you would see? So not many people know it, but egg crate, there's a thick side and a thin side. Okay. So our coral plugs fit snugly in one side and not so much in the other. Um, and by snugly, if anybody knows like the Dairy Queen blizzard, like you could tip over our egg crate and shake it and wow. they will stay put. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we do the, the plugs for most of our corals and then our soft corals, uh, like our zoanthids and our simularia are put on aragonite kind of bases. From Carib Sea, they actually send it over in giant pallets. Wow. Um, we mix it all up and then it takes, I think, about 30 days to fully cure um, and it takes our crew about 10 hours to create like 200 of them. So, you know, I don't see any power heads in here. How do you guys manage the flow? So we actually use uh, these surge devices. Uh, a lot of people know about them in the industry. There's been plenty of videos on them. Uh, we use essentially one pump. Uh, we siphon the water on each end as the water comes up, the siphon breaks, and then it pushes the water through. Uh, I think the timing between each of them is about 30 seconds, uh, and it creates tons and tons of flow, um, kind of like a gyre between each side of them. So we actually have four sumps. Um, each of these sumps is connected to just a quarter of our greenhouse. Okay. Um, I think it's roughly 20 to 25,000 gallons that we are running through this building. Yeah, so there's tons of fish. Uh, it's either rehomed fish from, you know, employees who have worked here. The fish have outgrown their systems. Uh, we bring them in here to kind of live out their days in paradise. And I mean, who wouldn't want to live in a right. coral greenhouse? So for right? the longest while, at least when I was beginning in the hobby, I thought of ORA as fish, but you guys have lots of coral. How many different species of coral do you guys have to offer? So I believe the number is around 150. At, wow. Not all in production at one given time, but roughly 150 throughout our production. That's pretty impressive. So that goes from like our soft corals to our hard corals, the 
beginner corals that kind of get you really excited about the hobby uh, to like the intermediate and even like the experienced corals, you know. Um, I think one of my very first corals, aside from green star polyps, of course, uh, was actually a galaxia coral. And it's one that you don't really see too often in your local fish stores anymore, but it's a really awesome coral. Um, and then, you know, you have your bird's nest and your styloforas, which are kind of like that beginner SPS, you know, when you're really starting to get into SPS corals, and getting into that stick, the stick fever. It's uh, <laughs> a great way to you know, I think. The stylophores and the bird's nests offer the most variety and coloration, as well as best chances of success starting out with sticks. And then, of course, you have the Space Invader Pectinia, which is a beast. Um, it certainly is an aggressive coral, uh, and you kind of got to know. Yeah, so mostly what we grow out in our sumps are going to be our encrusting or our plating corals, just because of the amount of space that they do take up. Um, everything else in our smaller kind of trough systems are going to be those plugs that you typically see from us. Okay. Uh, and here we have a number of chalices, cephastria, we have our space invader. Um, we do have some grow outs of our, our giant gigas clam as well as the hybrid maxima squamosa clam from our Marshall Island facility. Uh, this clam here uh, is our gigas clam and it's I think about two and a half, maybe going on three years old right now. So that started out as a two and a half inch clam, and now it's probably 12, 13 inches. Holy cow. Right, so we're over here at another one of the sumps, and I gotta say that this is the largest clam. The colors on it are incredible. Yeah, so, you know, natural sunlight. I mean, everybody runs a lot of blues these days uh, in their aquariums because they really want to highlight the coloration. Uh, but they, I think there's a misconception that you don't get that same kind of coloration under full spectrum. Um, I mean, we run everything under natural daylight, and I mean, clearly you can see that this is bright green, bright orange, blue, yellow, kind of brings out the coloration ten, tenfold. So these are our sunshades. Um, during certain periods of time throughout the year, we'll have more exposure to the sun than others. Right now we're starting to get into our summer season, so it's gonna be very, very bright, very hot in here. Our sunshades, essentially just like sunscreen to us, protect our corals. Uh, we do have corals placed in different portions of the greenhouse, and we monitor those by eye. We don't have anything that is automated in that sense. Okay. So all of our greenhouse technicians walk these troughs every day. They determine whether or not they're getting the lighting they need. Uh, the flow that they need and they can adjust that as necessary. If one particular coral looks fantastic coloration wise um, and growth, they'll start to stage out more coral of that variety in that trough as opposed to the other ends of the, the greenhouse to accommodate for the favor of light that it's receiving. And it can, just like in nature, bleach the corals out if there's too much par and too much light. You know, so many times we tell hobbyists and, you know, over the years, so much of what we do is paying attention and Correct. just spending time observing. Like, you can you can tell so much just by yeah, watching things. Absolutely. So, like, our red planet is one specifically uh, that you may see come on and off of our list at times. And it's because it goes through such a wild color variation in the winter. Um, it actually turns more of a green where like a historic, you know, uh, quintessential red planet is green at the base, vibrant red. During the winter, it, it turns more green. And everybody wants a red planet because it's red. That's fair. <laughs> so are these, all of the frags are, this have the same parents? They're all the same genetics? Correct. So, wow. so most of what you see here are kind of mini colonies. We don't grow anything out into full on giant colonies that we then kind of frag out. Uh, what we focus on is microfragmentation, uh, fragging of frags, of frags, of frags. Of frags. <laughs> you know, some of the corals in this coral greenhouse have been um, in production since the 80s. Wow. So our super stag has been in this coral greenhouse and um, really in production since I think the early 2000s, but its original aquaculture kind of background 
is from the mid 80s. That's impressive. So in addition to the corals that you guys sell, you guys also offer mangroves, right? We do. Uh, so similarly to our corals, uh, they go through kind of seasonal fluctuations. So right now we're getting into season where the propagules are starting to form on the trees. Um, and as soon as those start to drop, we can collect those uh, from all of the mango trees that we have here planted on campus. Oh, okay. And then we grow them out here and we offer them in the propagules, which are going to be essentially the seed pods with the roots starting to form or we do the sprouted mangroves, which are essentially oh. a full kind of mangrove ready to plant in your refugium. So we're lucky to be able to kind of offer these uh, in an aquaculture sense. All right, that's gonna do it for this video, but stay tuned for the next video where Donna's gonna take us over to the hatcheries and we can check things out. This has been Hillary and Donna for Waterlogged on behalf of saltwateraquarium.com. Thank you so much for watching.